everyone. This is Bridgerton Fancast. We are a podcast created by two fans to discuss the show Bridgerton. I'm Michelle. I live in the States. You can find me at Musings on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm Rita. I live in England and I'm at Annoying Rita on Instagram and Twitter. And welcome to our book club. Yay! Yay! Uh, uh, just a heads up, the discussion we're going to be having is pretty in-depth, so this is your book spoiler warning. If you haven't read the novel, this is going to be kind of confusing, <laughs> and we highly encourage you to do that, because why else are you here? So, without further ado, let's begin. The Viscount Who Loved Me by Julia Quinn was first published by Avon Books, December 5th, 2000, just 11 months after The Duke and I. It was a number one New York Times bestseller and a 2001 Rita (laughs) (laughs) Awards nomination in the long historical category and is widely considered to be the most popular book in the Bridgerton series and the reason it went from a planned trilogy to an eight-part series. Because the publishers saw some dollar signs. Some in dollar future. signs. <laughs> Ka-ching! Ka-ching! Okay, here's a brief overview. Uh, the book starts in April 1814, a year after the Duke and I, as the Sheffield sisters, so less satisfying than the Sharma sisters, I know. Um, arrive in London for their first season. Kate learns about Anthony's reputation through Lady Whistledown and is certain that he is far too much of a capital R rake to court her little sister. (laughs) Of course, they meet, immediately start bickering, and then slowly begin to fall for each other at Aubrey Hall, Uh, where the bee sting, remember that, (laughs) causes them to be caught in a very compromising position. Uh, They're forced to become engaged and marry over the course of of the rest of the book, they deal with their respective issues. Uh, Kate's trauma surrounding her mother's death when she was a child and Anthony's certainty that he will die young. And because of said fears of death, uh, Anthony pushes away all possibilities of marriage for love until he almost loses Kate in a carriage accident in the final chapter, where he apologises and declares his feelings and happy ending, kiss, kiss, kiss. Yay! Okay. Michelle, <laughs> yes, I have Rita. been hyping this book up for so long. <laughs> uh, I was like, no book can possibly live up to what <laughs> I have <laughs> said. But did you like it? Did it live up to my crazy amount of hype? Yeah, it did. Yay! Yeah, it did. I, it was a really super enjoyable read um, or listen as I listened to the audiobook. Um and, uh, you know, I, I found the story, um, you know, familiar in the, the structure, uh, but I found the, the way that Quinn wrote it was um, really just super engaging. Um, I, I love the banter and interaction between Kate and Anthony almost at the very moment that they met. Um, And, uh, you know, it just, it just kept getting better and better from there. So yeah, it, it definitely lived up to the hype. Yay. Mm -hmm. I love the banter. Like one of the things I think Julia Quinn is amazing at is just infusing all of the dialogue with such wit, like spark. Mm -hmm. And it's like really engaging throughout. Um, Yeah. That's what you want from a romance novel. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Did you, did you feel more satisfied having spent <sighs> some time with married Canthony? I still want more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a greedy cow. I can't help it. Um, you know, I, um, I kept finding myself saying, oh, I wish I'd seen this on screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd seen this on screen. Um, and, uh, you know, I loved the passion that they had for one another. Uh, the, the wedding night, I thought, was just top tier. Incredible. So well written. Um, and uh, I just I want more. I mean, <sighs> for me, like, this is a personal preference. Um, mm-hmm. But. 
I much prefer the conclusion of the story in the book. Um, oh, definitely. Just, I think, as little girls, we were so, like, these fairy tales of courtship and, you know, and then it all ends with a kiss and they live happily ever after. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's super <laughs> dissatisfying, actually. Um, yeah. Because there's just way more uh, nuance to personal relationships. And I think marriage mm-hmm. is, like, super hard. And to me, it makes much more sense to have most of the major conflicts happen when you've decided to be together. It's like, how are you going to make it work? Yeah, and I think that, you know, there are, uh, you know, folks that, you know, the the couple is just madly in love with one another and they they, you know, rush off to the altar and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's it's after after the honeymoon period, has started to, I, w- I don't want to say cool, yeah. but, you know, Wayne. It, it, it's waning. Um, you know, you then begin to t- see some of those realities that you may not have noticed um, in the past because you had your rose-colored glasses on. Um, you know, in this one, uh, you know, you could see them really kind of struggling through and reaching resolution on a lot of the uh, assumptions that they'd first begun carrying um, and to see how that kind of naturally um, unfolds into a um, a respect yeah. for one another and then, you know, this this love that grows from that. So, you know, it was... It was lovely to see how that wound up happening and it would have been it would have been great to have had a few more of those nuances in the TV show mm-hmm. but you know obviously they didn't have time since they um conflated the the love triangle uh situation um you know I I loved how it came together in the books, you know, it wasn't this angst-ridden. Um... I mean, there was angst, but the thing that was yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that is driving the plot isn't the love triangle. It's also like mm-hmm. these two people's self-discovery and they're dealing with their trauma and like how those two um, incidents of uh, parental death um, affected mm-hmm. them and like sort of like building a life where they like slot their two traumas together. <laughs> And like, yes, yes. And I think that's way more interesting than a love triangle. I'm just yeah. going to put that out there. Like, I've I, yeah, never been I a love too. triangle fan. And yeah. not that I think that, I, I, that the TV show ha- was like a traditional love triangle, but I think just, uh, it was just like conflict for the sake of conflict, right? Rather than going yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I get why they did it. I mean... You know, you and I survived pole dark, so you know. <laughs> love triangles we... galore. <laughs> love triangles all over the place. Um, but you know, it's like what what do these shows wind up doing, and, and what is it that draws in most of the viewers? Drama, sex, and drama. <laughs> and um, you know, Bridgerton one had both. Bridgerton two had much more drama a lot less sex than, <laughs> than than sex but the sex was there eventually um but drama is the thing that drives sales and so i get why they did what they did and they made the decision to go with uh uh the love triangle trope um but you know damn i'm a sucker for a relationship developing uh through um challenges yeah. and uh that kind of thing and so you know i i would have been eating it right. up uh if they had um uh stayed uh truer to the book um and i know we're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh in just a little bit um i'll i'll save the rest of my comments for when we get there um so thinking about the book on its own why do you think Mm -hmm. it was such a hit because it kind of blew everyone by surprise Hmm. you know i think that i think that quinn really really nailed the the formula that 
uh, needed to be in one of these books in order to make it successful. Um, you know, and I, I know we've spoken before about how, you know, in some of the, the early romance novels, you know, they're, they are bickering on page 10, uh, by page 50 or 55. They be fucking. Uh, they've, uh, <laughs> they, yeah. And, you know, and there is definitely a formula that goes along with uh, a lot of these books. Um, and especially, you know, back in the day, Avon was one of the big pulp romance mm -hmm. novel uh, publishers uh, that, you know, would come out with these little tiny thin books that, you know, you would gobble up in seconds. Um, but I think she really hit on a uh, formula uh, she, the, the way that she developed the characters of Anthony and Kate, um, I think had a lot to do with it. The fact that, uh, Kate was not this perfect diamond of the first water. Um, I think that there were probably a lot of, uh, readers that related to her more than someone who was, you know, absolutely stunningly beautiful and, you know, that kind oh, of thing. I think thing. it's funny. Everybody um, has this idea that Quinn's describing like this horrible, <laughs> like this ugly woman. And it's like, when you read the description, she's tall, she's got long flowing yeah. locks, like these beautiful full lips. You're like, um, mm -hmm. she's a hottie. She's a straight hottie. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You know, but, but she is, she is not what at mm -hmm. the time was the the favored the societal look, standard you know, of the, beauty has been exactly always shifting the, in ways that we uh, can uh, never live up to it's horrific yeah. exactly and especially for those of us who are women of color. oh yeah <laughs> because ain't no way in hell we look like any of the people that we wound up reading um about in these books um so uh, I, you know, but I, I think that, that the character of Kate, you know, she's smart. Uh, she is sassy. <laughs> um, she, she is, um, not afraid to speak her mind. Um, and, you know, those are all qualities that, you know, I, I think are absolutely essential to, you know, being a woman in the whatever year you're, you're in, um, you know, and so I think that, that she was relatable, um, more relatable than maybe Daphne in the first book. Um, and plus you have the, in, you know, the, the enchanting bickering that turns into respect and love Everyone's and favorite lust trope. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. What I love about this take on enemies to lovers is that it feels very like slapstick. There's... <laughs> You know, Anthony keeps falling into rivers. What is that, like three times now? Um, <laughs> and there's that bit where Kate starts biting his leg under the table. And yes. like, there's just like this element of it being kind of farcical and silly. Um, it reminded me a lot of those like slapstick comedies you'd get in the 30s and 40s, you know, with like, yeah. the buttoned up um, man and the like crazy woman. Um, mm -hmm. like, maybe bringing up baby maybe um yes yes i was just gonna say yeah. bring up baby um no uh gigantic cats roaming around thank god just a very <laughs> short fat corgi yes oh god i love newton in this yep. so much you can see why everyone was excited for newton and then in the show he's yes. barely in it oh not enough newton yes. um, oh. but i think there's also like this element of of depth to the story as well like you get mm -hmm. the fun banter but then when they're together you also get like this really intense trauma bond thing yeah um and they both sort of like they're unlike a, a traditional enemies to lovers where like they're two opposites that attract i think this is like two very similar people and like the thing that rubs them the wrong way is just how similar they are and then when they get to know uh -huh. each other it's like oh they're very fucking similar they have similar mm -hmm. um, like all the way down to their traumas yeah uh, you know uh but uh yeah i think i i think they're absolutely 
delightful. I totally understand why they are your favorite ship in this Well, they're my second favorite ship, but we can't talk about my favorite because spoilers. Um, Oh, okay. But like sort of very minorly below them. (laughs) Like it's... (laughs) It's a very close call. Um, so, who is your oh. favorite book characters? Because there's a lot of differences between how characters were in the show versus the books. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, leaving off Antony and Kate, um, thinking about the way that they characterized uh, Portia Featherington. <laughs> Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> wow. One of my favorite lines uh, from this book is completely missing um, from the show, and I was so disappointed. It's Portia when she oh. finds them, and she's like, <laughs> he had his mouth on her yes. boobies. Yes, her mouth on her boobies. Oh my god. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, aside from Anthony and Kate, um, you know, I would have to say. Um, Colin for being just a little pill. Ah, oh, God, the way <laughs> he winding, is down and winding to everybody fuck up with his brother is amazing. I know. <laughs> I just love. I just loved him in this book. Um, and uh, I love the fact that you know he is like instrumental in bringing um uh, Kate and Anthony together. He's a little matchmaker um, in the series. He is. And um, he it is. continues just, throughout the rest so of the sweet. novels. He sets all of his <laughs> siblings up. <laughs> we love him for that. Oh, God. Um, but yeah, I would say Colin. How about you? Um, for me, it's like a mixture of uh, Edwina and Mary. I think like Mary mm-hmm. Mary is so like delightful, lovely stepmother. And the conversation yes. she has with Kate where she's like talking about going to Kate's mother's grave and like having mm-hmm. conversations with her grave and and taking mm-hmm. Kate there and little Kate would give her mother updates on how Mary was doing. I just thought that was so sweet. Like yeah. I love their relationship yeah. on screen, but it doesn't have the depth mm-hmm. that it does in the book. No. And I think No, it sure it certainly does not. Yeah, and I think like that's really sad because we don't really get many stepmother um, daughter mm-hmm. relationships that are this positive on screen and this, such mm-hmm. a missed opportunity. Um, but yeah. I also love Edwina so much in the book. She is just <laughs> such a little. <laughs> She's constantly teasing everyone, and it's delightful. Yes, the way that she was like desperate to get in on that um, conversation um, <laughs> about sex. She's like, "I bought you some milk." <laughs> just gonna stick around (laughs) nobody's gonna notice (laughs) pay no attention to the person over on the chaise lounge (laughs) she's so cute and nothing to see she feels like such a little sister like yeah and it's like just it's a pleasant time after the high drama of season two just to like be back in the just the relative comfort of the book where these mm-hmm. two sisters are just friendly and supportive and they love each other mm-hmm. and there's no complications nobody's going after a man um i think the search <laughs> for drama in every relationship on this show has created this situation where there's like barely any positive female friendship um yeah. and you know i respect julia quinn for like not going the obvious route with these two it would have been so easy mm-hmm. to make this into like a combative relationship but she yeah. subverted those expectations and these two sisters just love each other um beyond all else at, and it's a, mm-hmm. just it's delightful i was like can we have more edwina making jokes please it's fun yes <laughs> Uh, such a such a clever character, um, and I loved you know how uh, Mary was very clear and straightforward with Kate when it came to talking with her about what the marital expectations were. It made me go, uh huh, uh, Violet, take some notes. <laughs> take yeah, take take some notes on what's going on over here. Um, you know, uh, and just how how much she cares for both of her daughters and that there was, 
you know, she may have been a stepmother by um, designation or, you know, however you want to call it, title. Um, but, you know, Mary was mother, you know, in all but the word uh, for Kate. And the, the scene where, um, you know, Kate is, uh, they're revealing what's going on with Kate's trauma. Um, that was heartbreaking. That was heartbreaking and gave me goosebumps. I did find the description of like her mother sitting up in bed mm-hmm. completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, that's like yeah. something out of a horror movie. Like, is this yeah. the exorcist? And then I'm like, oh God. But I bet mm-hmm. you that happens. <laughs> it does. That it would does. traumatize the shit out um, of me. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, there it's, you know, it is. Um, somewhat common for individuals who are, uh, like in hospice or, you know, uh, palliative care and they are, uh, nearing the end to, to have a moment of clarity, um, before they pass away. Um, and I mean, maybe not as zombie like, that uh, was the- active as, as we saw in the novel, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and I, I can imagine that as a little child, uh, that would have been absolutely terrifying. Scares me a little as a grown woman, so that's poor Kate. And I kind of like that it's sort of like a repressed memory that she unconsciously knew, but mm-hmm. like didn't remember. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think like yeah, so much, um, often like trauma is sort of just sort of worms its way into your subconscious without you even really like it becomes a part of you without you even really knowing mm-hmm. sometimes um unlike anthony's trauma which was just like such a central part of his whole being kate's was sort of like yes. subconscious which i think is like an interesting mm-hmm. con- contrast that's what i was going for mm-hmm. um yeah so um was there anything you didn't like as much about the novel um that whole carriage accident Ugh. I mean, much preferred over her hitting her head and being in a coma for a beautiful, in a beautiful coma. Beautiful for a coma, week. sleeping yes. beauty. Yeah. Um, but it I... it was it was terribly violent. Um, when he's dragging her body and she's screaming. God. Oh. Yeah, I had to to pause it there and just kind of kind of stand up and walk around the room a little bit and you know that kind of thing because it was just i gotta say it it's too mu- real it's much better to read it on the page because you don't have to, <laughs> to hear the sounds <laughs> and the screams um yeah Ugh. but i do um, prefer the carriage accident to the head bump. yes yeah the head the the head the head bump and coma for a week is way too soap opera yeah for me yeah i mean you know if they'd if they'd had her wake up and she had amnesia uh, <laughs> i was know, like oh no I, we're I, gonna I, go back I, to the I beginning would have thrown something i would have thrown something at the television um, uh, but it's from and um, the end of the duke and i if you remember um he goes mm-hmm. looking for daphne and she's running and she falls off the horse and blah blah yeah. blah so they basically swapped out the whole ending from the duke and i again yeah to, kate and anthony but it wasn't a good ending in that book and it's not a good ending in no. the show. No. um yeah oh, it's just we disappoint um yeah i how about you i think for me um violet is a bit of an afterthought in the narrative of the book and i prefer mm-hmm. the way the show stunted her grief as part of anthony's issues yes i agree with you oh that I don't really think there's anything else. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I no. I mean, it was it was a, a an a absolute uh, delight to read. Um, but I did notice that you know it's like Anthony reflects on you know what his mother must have gone through. Um, you know, after her or uh, after his father's death. You know, as he's you know coming to terms with his own uh, situation uh, uh, and his love for Kate. Um, you know, it, it's the first time he's really giving it any thought. Um, and, you know, you're right. The the show, and I really appreciate this about the show, um, really nailed um, the grief that uh, Violet experienced and, and what it what it feels like 
to to grieve for someone you love that much. Um, so yeah, but I know we talked about that in the in, <laughs> in the podcast earlier. You got enough hours on that. Um, <laughs> favorite scenes? Um, God, so uh, many. all of the scenes <laughs> with Kate. yeah, <laughs> all of them. Um, uh, I loved the the bee sting scene. Iconic, right? Yes. I I think oh I tried to explain God. to you like the tone is so different. It is it's like <laughs> it it goes from like high drama to farce in under a yes. second and you're like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> oh god, that was awesome. Um I think the the scene the scene where she winds up in his library under the desk while Anthony is in there um, wooing the opera singer. Oh, yeah. That was hilarious. I love that scene. Um, <laughs> that was hilarious. Uh, um, did you notice her name? Yes, I did. Was it like, this is the character that they built an mm-hmm. entire season around? Mm-hmm. I wanted to weep. Also, how much better is she as a character in the book? <laughs> like, she's just like, oh, yeah. Hey. Absolutely. You're not down to <laughs> you're not down to fuck. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right. See ya. See ya. Fun times. Uh p- Pow Mal. Yes. Oh. oh. Pow Mal. Oh. I also love the aftermath of Pow Mal where they're they're like tidying <laughs> up and then Yes. They're walking back into the house and like he just looks at her and he's like, I'm so happy, I like her. Um Yes. Um, where they they re- like they just start laughing for no reason. I was like, oh, this is so sweet. I want more of yeah. this. Why can't yeah. we live in this world where they're just happy and together? And- yeah, you know, it was the the same kind of feeling that we had in the show, where uh, you know the two of them waded into the bog and then eventually fall over in it. Yeah, so cute. And you know they. And they, you know, look at each other and they just start giggling. You know, it's just... All of the squishy feelings. <laughs> it's that! It's the squishy goodness! A really terrific, terrific book. I might think one of my favourite scenes is the library scene where Anthony uh, uh-huh. comforts Kate during her panic attack. Like, yes. I just wish... I so wish that storyline had made it into the show. And yes. Kate and Anthony, like, that's so moving in the way that he's just he just sort of unconsciously starts calling her kate like it moves me to new levels Mm -hmm. um and i also loved anthony escorting penelope into dinner and kate just being like hot eyes emoji my hero yes she just suddenly realizes that there's more to him than she had previously than than meets the eye Mm -hmm. there's also that bit where she's like she looks at him she's oh my god you're nice (laughs) and he's And he's like, yes. don't tell anyone. I have a reputation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think like one oh, thing I God. really loved, like I didn't really think about it until after I'd seen season two, was just how uh, how much more Kate interacts with the rest of the Bridgertons in this book. Like she has scenes mm-hmm. with Colin and Eloise, and even with Violet. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, what I would mm-hmm. give for a Kate and Violet scene. <laughs> Um, oh, I know, right? It just establishes Ugh. her um, in the role of Viscountess more, and like she has a relationship with the family that she's joining. And then, mm-hmm. conversely, you get that scene where Edwina jokes with Anthony about how she always wanted a brother. Like that just makes me really happy because I think like family is so important these characters, and like an important element mm-hmm. is seeing how they interact with each other's families. Like with the yeah. show, I'm forever going to be traumatized by the fact that he nearly married Edwina. Like I'm like that's, <laughs> no, that's right. always in there. <laughs> that's always gonna be in the background of his interactions with her. It's weird. It's hard highly weird and like we're yeah. never gonna get like a normal <laughs> bantery relationship between those two yeah uh you know it's it's gonna take it's gonna take a long 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 time for them to get to a point where they're they're going to be at ease with one another um but uh you know i was just thinking you know the the scene in the library where he is um calming uh kate and comforting kate i can't imagine how distressed you must have been to 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 not see that on screen 
I didn't. I did, I expected it. It's the <laughs> that's the harsh reality of. Um, I was like, well, the first thing they're going to do is get rid of that storyline because they had done such little work with Simon's in season one. His all of his mm-hmm. his trauma. I was just like, well, Anthony's yeah. trauma is so integral to the whole plot, and I think Kate's mm-hmm. is more like a fun sprinkle on top, and they just yeah yeah. So. It was distressing, but not unexpected. Sort of like mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of things on this show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Favorite quotes. And this is why I was like scrabbling around trying to find my print copy. Um, you know, we just moved. And so it's somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in this house uh, so that I would be able to pull up a, a quote or two. But, uh, you know, I, I, I got I got nothing, man. Uh, what are some of yours? Because I know that you probably have a list with a capital I, L. I just picked one. <laughs> but um, Really? Off the top of my head, I can think of a few. Um, my mm-hmm. favorite one is when he says, like, your mean streak is one of the things I like best about you <laughs> to her. And she's like, goodness. <laughs> I just hate to know what you like least. <laughs> it's just so cute. So... So, like, they had oh, so many. And I love, um, actually, the whole speech he gives when, he, when they're having sex, um, where he's like, I will say this only once. I find yes. the fact that he's only saying it once hilarious. Like, babes, you can repeat this. Um, <laughs> like, that, I, I can't read that whole thing out. Like, it's like two pages long, but that speech he gives is incredible. Um, just absolutely top notch, oh, and I man. love that he gives a whole speech like on the verge of climax. He's like, "No, yes. we're going to stop and discuss this." It's like Anthony, man, you you got you got some some stamina and control, right? Brother. The self control that like a lot of I think uh, like uh, a lot of romance novels of the past would have been like, no, he just kept going, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's like, like, no, Anthony's going to stop and have a bit of a dissertation. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, it, yeah, incredible. That's hilarious. I love Anthony. Just absolutely. Yeah, and also, like, just all of the banter um, mm-hmm. earlier on with the with when he's, like, screaming at everyone um, about <laughs> Newton, like... <laughs> Women who own dogs should know how to control them and all that shit. Like I just, and also when he sees uh, Portia and like somebody, he's like somebody, yeah, had to shut up. Or I'm going to kill her, and then Portia's like, "Oh my!" Um, just anytime Anthony screams hysterically is like such a mood because as a hy- hyperbolic, um, oh my god, Portuguese lady, I relate. <laughs> It seems like every other moment he's like wishing that he'd had a pistol yeah. so that he could shoot one of his brothers. Yeah. Usually Colin. Usually Colin. <laughs> Isn't it funny how like in the books Colin is like such a huge <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> um such a huge figure and then he's just yeah. a non entity in Anthony's life in the show. Yeah. It's so uh-huh. annoying. Um Ugh. Anyway, now here's with the section. I was going to do a whole list of things they changed for the show because readers, that's, uh, well, not readers, listeners, that's what I did for the f- our first book club. But, right. God, everything was different. So, yeah. like, do you want to be here all year? Like, I, <laughs> it would have been a shorter list to come up with things that were the same. Um, yes. And not even the uh, names were the same. I was going to say, <laughs> the, their first names were the same. Not even that. Okay. Well, I mean, the, if we're not looking at, like, the full name, if we're looking at, like, the... the shortening. The it's... shorter names, then yes. I mean, that's they are the very, same. very specific. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> it's in London, brief. <laughs> <laughs> and it also goes out to the country. Ooh. To the... Aubrey Hall. That I, okay here's okay real talk <laughs> here's the thing i noticed you know yes. um in the book they say that aubrey hall's in kent i assume uh-huh. that's the same in the book and they're all like oh marina lives nearby you can go visit her 
Marina mm-hmm. in season one said she was from Somerset. <laughs> and I would assume that that's where the cranes were from, because yes. why would they go into church together otherwise? Mm-hmm. Weird. Oh, they had to plot be holes on plot close. holes on plot holes. <laughs> it's just like a <laughs> plot hole sandwich with layers. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, but let's see. Uh, as far as the most surprising change... Uh, that we saw uh, between book and show. Well, obvi- I mean, the, the the big one is the whole love triangle thing. Um, you know, we, we can't get away from that uh, because it, like, fundamentally um, caused the show to have to basically kind of rejigger itself into, you know, down another path. You know, we've talked about how, you know, some of the storylines that were in the book you know, wound up being, you know, 86 because of the love triangle and, and all of that. Um, so I don't know if I would say it was surprising. I mean, I did warn you. Like, yeah, you did. Constantly. Yeah, like, you did. That's why I like this book. Yeah. Just me, the whole, the whole, the whole season, I was just complaining. And I apologize for that, but it is what it is. <laughs> well, I mean... And I think here's the here's the thing about um, this show and um, the books. I and I, honest to God, I don't know why I couldn't have this same mindset when it came to Paul Dark. Um, yeah, but, I d- we've had a real shift in perspective since Paul Dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that that both adaptations work. I mean, the 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 book. And the adaptation, I think they work, you know, they both work as uh, entertaining. Obviously, um, I loved the show. Um, and just because I've read the book doesn't make me go, well, the show sucks, you know. Um, it you know, genuinely I'll- doesn't suck. Just, I have nitpicks because... There were missed opportunities. There were missed opportunities, but it's not... It's not enough to rob me of the enjoyment I felt um, in season two, um, you know, uh, and we we won't go into kind of how that didn't quite work out for <laughs> Poldark. For, for <laughs> I don't um, know what was wrong with us when we were watching Poldark, oh but God. we could not remove ourselves from the book. <laughs> canon is canon, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, as far as, uh, surprising changes, um, not a surprise, but you know, the change. How about you? Anything? Well, you'd already read the book. I'd already so... read the book. So yeah, yeah. So... but like I said, like I expected some of the changes that they made because mm-hmm. I can be kind of ruthless <laughs> in my assessment <laughs> of how to streamline narratives. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I saw that coming. And to be honest, like what they and they removed her trauma, but they did end up replacing it with this very interesting uh, change in dynamic between the sisters. And yeah, I still really appreciated that storyline. And I think you know it's good in a different way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that I probably would have been. Okay, it ain't no probably about it. Um, If they had cut to the uh, Kate and Anthony getting together sooner, you know, not getting in front of the freaking altar and having the revelation that, oh my God, Anthony's staring at my sister more than, you know, if they'd done, if they'd done that sooner, um, I think I would have been happier but again, drama. Yeah. Drama. I just think like that the end of episode, the episode before the wedding would have been a great opportunity to knock this whole engagement in the bud. <laughs> and they were like, yep. no, nope, we're still careening down this path. <laughs> <laughs> because we need to have this More great big giant drama. goofy thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm like, no, you don't. You really, really don't. <laughs> I guess like. Um, the biggest thing that changed was the Sheffield slash Sam Sharma dynamic. Like all mm-hmm. three people's relationships 
changed. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about that adaptation onto the screen? Um, you know, well, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, how, you know, in the book, there is a, an absolute closeness between the, the three Sheffields. Um, you know, and I think that the, the way that it wound up, uh, manifesting itself in the show with Kate kind of taking over the running of the family while Mary was, you know, am I just where was I she? I don't know what she was doing. Um, you know, and assuming the parenting role <laughs> of uh her sister, um, you know, we we saw that in the book, uh Kate had uh was protective of um Edwina, but it wasn't to the same level, I think. Yeah, book Kate wouldn't have been like, please marry my sister, Anthony. Do it immediately, yeah. please. I'm begging yeah. you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that, that while we lost the the trauma storyline, we gained the drama storyline <laughs> um, that existed, you know, between the, the three Sharmas. Um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, we had, you know, Kate finally getting, um, the words that she needed from Mary about how she never saw Kate as a stepdaughter, that she was always a daughter. Um, you know, we, we know that that is how Mary Sheffield has always seen, uh, Kate. Um, but, you know, we, had that little moment during the the uh, foobar of the wedding where, you know, Edwina, I think, says stepsister. And, uh, you know, that is, you know, clearly a kind of reemphasizing the yes, I know I'm not I'm not your blood. I, I shouldn't have an expectation of uh, being able to marry into uh british aristocracy or or um um you know marry into the ton because you know i am not one of you what did you think about them changing that from the novel because i felt like they changed it that they didn't really address it because in the novel mary has a first marriage to a man of uh lower status and then marries um, Kate's father who is a gentleman and yeah. Kate is a gentleman's daughter and she is of the right um, well she's not aristocracy but she is gentility so you know she's good enough yes. she's yeah she is she is uh, one of the um, the poorer members of the gentry um, but uh, yeah, still you know, she rolling is, in money she was <laughs> exactly she was still she's still a gentleman's daughter um you know, um, I don't know how to feel about it. Um, I like the fact that they were, they were doing the season their way, you know, in the book or in the show, you know, they, um, have Lady, um, Danbury. Danbury. They have Lady Danbury, who is their, um, their patron, their whatever the word is, which, just flew out of my head but you know that they are under her protection yeah uh for the season and you know as a result you know they're arriving you know to parties and things like that in danbury's very fancy carriage and you know and they have you know all of these amazing gowns and and all of that kind of stuff um you know you see that with the Sharmas, you know, they have been able to uh, get a foot in with Danbury, whereas the Sheffields are doing it on their own. And, you know, when Anthony is uh, looking out of the window at Aubrey Hall as people are arriving for the, the, um, the weekend, um, you know, he notices that this, you know, not noticeably less expensive and slightly shabbier carriage is coming in. And, you know, he knows that that's going to be the Sheffields. 
because like everybody knows that the Sheffields aren't rolling around in in crazy ton money that uh, that everybody else is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something that is apparent. You know, if he's noticing it, you know, damn well, everybody else is. No, Portia is. Um, I oh. just... And Cressida. I, just, I have a problem with them making the choice of having her not be gentility and then never talking about mm-hmm. it. It's like, mm-hmm. why do it then? I question mark. Yeah. <laughs> like, you've made this choice lean into it. Um, mm-hmm. because class differences mm-hmm. are so ingrained into British society that it would have been a huge problem. Like, I can't imagine yeah. that it would have been easy for someone of her birth to be then become a Viscountess. Like, fucking hell. Yeah. Um, I hope they explore that in season three, at least, because otherwise it's like, why? Why? <laughs> why make this choice? <laughs> it feels bizarre to me. Um, yeah. But I think, other than that, um, one thing that really struck me uh, um, on reflection after having read the book again was just how much agency they removed from Edwina in the TV show. Like, mm, mm-hmm. she's fully aware of the her financial responsibility towards her family. I think it like it's one of the defining central aspects of her character, and then having that removed mm-hmm. was like it made such a huge impact on the character where she was basically just nice and that was it for the first six or seven episodes just Mm -hmm. bizarre to me because i think it's such an interesting conflict that we don't really see on screen very much um especially for women it's like having this responsibility of yeah you're trying to look for a love match but you're also responsible for the entire future of your family Mm -hmm. and you're 17 years old i think yeah. That is such an interesting conflict, um, and it would have mm-hmm. been interesting to me to have that reflected on screen. Like, I don't think her not knowing about the arrangement added anything to storyline. I think it would have given her a better reason to pursue this relationship with Anthony. Um, and I remember before the season, <laughs> Ed, um, I read an interview with Chris Van Dusen where he called the character of Edwina in the book One Dimensional, and I was immediately like, well, I'm not reading any interview (laughs) ever again, because I disagree (laughs) with that take. I don't think she's one dimensional. I think, how do I put this? She's a minor character, obviously. She's not Mm -hmm. incredibly important to the overall storyline, but one of the strengths of Julia Quinn's writing is that she manages to make even the most tiny character appearance like Lady Danbury at the end like she infuses pe- she mm-hmm. writes three dimensional minor characters like she puts yeah. great thought into Edwina's conflicts and her aspirations and how she fits into the family and I felt like she was fully formed in the book in a way that she isn't mm-hmm. in the show so like Agreed. having read that interview I just want to side eye Chris Van Dusen a little like just because she's in more dramatic situations and it is more important in the storyline doesn't necessarily make her more a well-rounded character. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to give your characters more than just drama. Drama. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <sighs> you know, and I, I mean, I still remember, you know, seeing, you know, episodes and how... You know, Edwina was just totally wrapped up with being the Viscountess. (laughs) I will will be your Viscountess. (laughs) Wow, really? Did you just say that? (laughs) That line lives rent-free in our heads. I think it's just the way (laughs) Sharitha Chandran pronounces Viscountess. It's Viscountess! Viscountess! And like, in the real world, we call it a Viscountess. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's funny. Oh, um, oh so Lord. were there aspects of this you preferred in the show? Hmm. I mean, other than the whole Violet isn't a non-entity thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think um, we, you know, it, and it, we have the opportunity to see Edmund um, alive uh, for a brief shining moment. Um I mean, he's killing something while he's on screen, so, like, side-eye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, 
and we kind of see how this, how Anthony's trauma is formed. Um, you know, we read about it in the book. It was, I thought it was nice to see them uh, play that out um, through that entire episode. Um, you know, when they were at, uh, back at Aubrey Hall uh, for the uh, party, you know, having those flashback moments, um, I thought were, were great. Um, and it would have been nice to see, have some kind of interaction between uh, Anthony and his mother related to the sheer grief that they experienced. So I will say you do get more on Violet's relationship with Edmund and her grief in some of the later novels. So mm-hmm. fans of depressed Violet will not be disappointed. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. coming. Okay, great. Um, great. I think obviously one of the huge strengths was just having a South Asian family at the center of the story. Oh, I mean, yeah. not only did it give people the representation on screen they desperately needed, but I think it also had real purpose in the story. It enhances the sense of them being outsiders. And mm-hmm. you know, Kate Isolation seems much more profound on the show. She's always by herself. Yeah. And I yeah. think like that is just an excellent choice because it's not just done to tick a box. It enhances mm-hmm. the story as well. Um, mm-hmm. which is what you want. Um, yeah, and that's a really great uh, observation, Rita. I try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I also have, like, one thing that's always bugged me about the book um, is Kate's just antipathy and, like, just anger. She's very angry at Anthony. And yeah. based on her reading, like, one lady whistle down column. <laughs> seriously it's so dumb <laughs> so so dumb i've always been like she's irrational what the fuck's wrong with her um so i might prefer like the show having her actually witness him being a dick and then go yeah. being like you're a dick because that's that's based on an observable fact in the book He's actually quite pleasant with her and she's stomping on his foot and it's like Yes. When she gets mad that he says that he says something like, Oh, you're just as beautiful as your sister and she becomes furious. I'm like Yes. You're trying to be nice. Like, can you calm down? <laughs> she's like, I'm furious. Yeah. yeah. It's I just think Kate's reason for disliking him is so much better in the show. So, yeah, so much better. Absolutely. And then there's also, like, the inclusion of, like, Lady Danbury, which I think is fun. I mean, it, it's to the detriment oh. of her relationship with Mary, which is less fun. Um, yeah. But I just like, like, Lady Danbury's fresh and fierce, and we love it. We we adore, we, we stand Lady Danbury. Um, and, you know, I, I loved the scenes between she and Kate. Um, you know, um, I, I I honestly can't say I would want to get rid of any of them. I I mean, I just love watching the two actresses work work off each other. Um, are there any scenes you wish had stayed in the show? I wish we'd had the scene where Newton goes off in the park and they wind up in the serpentine. I understand we wound up getting that kind of kind of. It's so weird. Like you don't even know Newton's at that. <laughs> I know. That thing, and then it's like, why is Newton there? Why is he next to the wall? Why? Why? <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Thank you for your service, Newton. You, you have become something for them to trip over. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that would have been a lot of fun to see that happen. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with an answer that's not just, please give me Kate's storm phobia back. Please. <laughs> oh, Yeah. God, you know, she would have acted the shit out of that. She, oh my God. She was in, like, that one scene where she was <sighs> flinching at this. And mm-hmm. I was like, this is incredible. Maybe they're giving me the phobia storyline and I was wrong to doubt them. <laughs> it's like, and no. no. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, was, I was wrong. No, I'm right. Okay. <laughs> uh, just like, can oh, I say one God. thing? It's absolute bullshit that they would, mm. they would spend so much time and Anthony issues and then just completely remove Kate's trauma. Uh, it's just like, why, <laughs> why, why is the female lead's storyline less important than the male? Can we just have some equity here? Uh. It's because we had to have a lovely love triangle. <sighs> 
It took up all the air time. It's annoying. I, you know, I love a good <sighs> moment where people are in their night clothes when they're not supposed to be in the meeting in the dark. This is why I love Jane Eyre mm-hmm. so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ooh, scandalous. Um, <laughs> yes. Just like, like they could have just made the little library scene that we did have a bit longer. That would have been nice. I would. I just want to spend some time with them feeling cozy in the store. Um, yes. That would have. Um, yeah. I've mentioned so many other scenes I enjoyed. <laughs> All of those. I also think, like, Colin introducing them is an aspect that yes. is just so fun. And I think, like, they're not showing Colin being fun. It's like he's so yeah. serious and he loves fucking with people. And it's one of the most delightful <laughs> things about him. It made me a, a Colin stan. And, like, oh. and there's just, like, oh. the sense that his brothers are frightened of him in the show and like in the books it's like they're just like yeah he's scary but we're gonna fuck with him <laughs> exactly exactly and i love that i love that for everyone yeah eh. um okay anything you think just didn't translate onto screen in the end i think we kind of talked a little bit around a number of things um you know the the fact that uh we did lose the you know Kate's trauma um we but I mean that's up... more like the absence of things was there anything that they did adapt but you thought was done badly ah I see I see um for me I think it might be everything surrounding the mortality aspect um because hmm. in the show they're definitely like oh he's scared of bees and that's it <laughs> Mm. And I think I see what you're saying. In the book, it's very clear that he's not really scared of the bee so much as he is scared of death. And I don't yes. think the show really grasped that, or they chose not to deal with it. But I think that's a huge disappointment for me because I feel like it's like it's a major issue surrounding men's mental health, like the psychology mm-hmm. of how they they are socialized to think of death and. And legacy and everything surrounding it is so unhealthy. And it's a shame they didn't tackle that because I think that makes more sense to me than him having a faux pure of peace. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Um, yeah. No, I, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying now. And, um, you know, I, I would agree with you. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the way that in the book, you know, he keeps repeating you know, a man can't be brought down by a bee, you know, you know, a bee is too small, uh, to do something like that. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It, it's, it, it boggles the mind that that's what would happen. And, um, the, the fact that, you know, Anthony gets, you know, wrapped around the thought that, you know, he is not going to live past the same age of his father. Um, you know, and and it's not even that, um, it's going to be a bee sting that kills him. Uh, it's, it's a matter of, he's not going to live past, uh, his father's age. Um, and that was absolutely not brought up in the adaptation. Don't you think it makes so much more sense as well? Because he has this sense of urgency that is, that is still in the yeah, show. Yeah, the reason he is getting addressed. married, you know, the reason why he finally says, okay, I got to do this thing is because the clock's ticking and I only have so many years left. So there's a scene in season one where um, Violet is like, you're running out of time <laughs> to mm-hmm. him. Oh, yeah. If you got the time, you yeah, you're running out of time. Violet. Time's a ticking. And you're just like, oh, God. And it's almost like they wanted to address mm-hmm. that in season one. And then they wrote season two. And, and it was like, like, never mind. Yeah. Never mind about that. <sighs> Grr. Okay. So this is sort of a tongue-in-cheek <laughs> question. Hey, I'm reading this script <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, girl. You have to choose. There's no! a gun against your head. Book or TV show? Oh, God bless it. Oh, read her. I mean, you don't have to answer it. It's like, yeah, yeah. You can like both. This is <laughs> Oh, I mean, I absolutely, I absolutely like both. Um, um, I loved the book. Um, personal preference, I think I just prefer 
the medium of books. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. I like being inside people's perspectives, and I don't think you can get that as much in a TV yeah. show. I think the pure anger and panic in Anthony is hilarious to me. <laughs> the way he's just like, oh my fucking god, at everything. <laughs> Um, he has no ch- he has no chill no he does and not I love that he does not he's just fab he's just- I mean, and the, Kate the, is so sensible I mean the scene the scene after you know they've made love and he has the realization that he's fallen in love with her and he like, like bitch I need to leave he I'm going up out of the bed and he's trying to put his shirt on his foot and he keeps put- and- missing the leg with his pants yes! it's so funny yes! Oh my god! So yeah, uh, I I love the book. Um, I think the 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 book was an absolute delight. Um, I'm gonna find my hard copy and actually read it um, because that will be fun to to just flip the pages and and read it um, on a rainy day, which we seem to have a whole bunch of here in the on the wet coast. Uh, <laughs> um, or actually, I should say the wet corner of the coast. Um, yeah, it's pretty dry down in California. Yeah, yeah, down in California, not so wet. Up here, plenty wet. All of the rain. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to to reading the the paper copy as soon as I find it. And oh, I I if you all go on Instagram, I'll post um, a photo of my. I found my original copy. Um, oh fun from the 2000s um, oh fun I when I was reading I read from the TV tie-in cover because I was like bitch I bought this I made from it but then <laughs> <laughs> I found I was like I need to find the old version and it has an amazing illustration oh, like God, a, a step back wait. you have to oh it's just it's like why are you wait. naked in a forest um, <laughs> so oh God wait. I can't wait oh And for those of you out there who are thinking of listening to the uh, audiobook, uh, be warned, there is a second epilogue on on the uh, audiobook. Did you listen? (laughs) I started listening and then I was like... Oh, spoilers. I mean... Stop it. I don't... Wait. It's like it's not... I think you could listen to it because um, I think the only other characters in it Colin and Penelope, and you know they end up right. together, right? Exactly, but exactly. Could listen to um, it. but uh, but yeah. So there, there is a spoiler. So just be be aware. Okay, inbox time. Let's see, hey ladies, formerly pregnant Amy here. Ah! Um, <laughs> congratulations. Well done. Yes, I actually got to hear my email read out while I was in the hospital after having my bebe, <laughs> Moira Roy's voice, um, which was lovely. Uh, anyway, Bridgerton, uh, it was great to be able to go back and reread the Viscount Who Loved Me audiobook. Unfortunately, newborns don't leave time to sit down and read, I understand, and compare book and show Canthony. Uh, for Kate, I wish show Kate got some flashbacks like Anthony. <sighs> Maybe to her relationship with her father or the death of her mother. I love the way Book Kate and Anthony both have residual trauma of parental loss, which gives them an understanding of each other. I know this happens in the series too, but I think the book gives us a greater insight into how Kate's loss of both her parents at different times in her life affected her. For Anthony, I prefer show Anthony's reasoning for not wanting love in his marriage. I think seeing how his father's death affected his mother and his own relationship with her was more effective than his obsession with death and being convinced he would die young. Anthony is a couple. For me, the book has a slight, has the slightly better arc as there is no love triangle and we get more of them together. But the show was that holy shit, this is hot (laughs) sexual tension between Jonathan and Simone that surpasses the book for me. Thanks again for keeping me sane in those last weeks of pregnancy and the exhaustion of early motherhood. Amy, P.S. I had a boy, so unfortunately Rita was not a name option. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Let's see. P.P.S. I did not know that Nigel Burbrook was also... Kieran from Dairy Girls, they look so different on the two shows, 
and that the actor is from my home county in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, <laughs> everyone watch Derry Girls. It's delightful. Um, and I loved Kieran, which made me very uncomfortable when I realized who he was. <laughs> <laughs> Our next email said, Hi, Rita and Michelle. I've read this book four times and I love it. I don't picture the show when I read or reread the books. They are different in my eyes, but entertaining nonetheless. I have seen many comments on social media about readers being put off by book Kate's low self-esteem being tied to her perceived as being not as pretty as Edwina. Wondering as to your thoughts on that. I actually found it relatable as low self-esteem sufferer tied also to perceive lack of not being physically good enough. I know it's not a message that we want to send to women about physical appearance, but it does exist, and I liked how it made a part of Kate's story. Um, It doesn't take away from her being quick, funny, and often times self-confident, particularly in her efforts to interfere with Anthony de Vidwina. In fact, it was Kate's non-physical attributes that make her so attractive to Anthony. Her competitiveness, her devotion to her family, and her wit. Maybe the frustration with her low self-esteem is because it's very different from the way Kate appears on the show, but TV Kate has low self-esteem, just for a different reason. Feeling unworthy of love because of her place, or lack thereof, in her family. A few other observations. Colin gets Kate from the start. He's much smarter in the books than he's been Mm -hmm. through season two in the book. Almost immediately, he recognises she's the female version of Anthony, and it's quite funny how he brings them together at the ball. (laughs) Book Betrothal Ring sounds much prettier from its description than the one they use in the show. (laughs) And apparently, there were many Bridgerton heirloom rings, which they should have worked into the show so that Kate and Edwina didn't end up with the same ring. I get it was Violet's ring, but that ring is tired from all the appearances it made by episode 8. I also wish there was a cake-obsessed jeweler in the book. Oh, yes. I get that people didn't marry for love back then, but really, how did book Anthony think he wasn't going to fall in love with All the warmth and affection he was showing her with once he decided to marry her and even after their marriage. He was... Uh, he was. He also was delusional slash in denial because he clearly loved her before they were married. What <laughs> man is dropping to his knees saying he'd do anything in his power for her except a guy in love? Oh, Anthony, wake up. Good to see he has that in common with TV, Anthony. Um, Mary really left Kate with some trauma from her pre-wedding night sex talk feeding into her low self-esteem. Poor woman thinking he was picturing Edwina. That made me so sad for her. Speaking of wedding night, that scene really takes the reader for a ride. (laughs) From really steamy to sad to bliss. Great job, Julia Quinn. Thank you both for your podcast. I love it. And I love having a place where I can geek out over my love of Bridgerton. I might have to follow along for the three and only watch one episode at a time along with you. Oh, my God. Woo-hoo! That's insane. I'm not sure if you can fulfill that. <laughs> um, I don't know if I have that kind of self-control. But I do think it allows you to view the series in a whole different light. Keep laughing, Michelle. You have the best laugh. <laughs> And then you laugh. <laughs> okay, well done to you both. And this is Mary Beth, uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Ooh. I'm embarrassed. Thank you. Um, pl- pl- is that where the Mayflower? Um, Plymouth, landed? yes. See, I'm just learning all the time, guys. See, there you Thank go. Thank you, Americans. There you go. Okay. Uh, hello again, wonderful women. After finishing season two of Bridgerton, I jumped right into the Viscount Who Loved Me. Given all the hype, I was disappointed about the lack of consent in some of the key intimate scenes. I know bodice rippers are meant to be sexy fun times, but we have to look critically at these scenes given the context of our current culture that still struggles massively with consent. Trigger warning, rape, assault. When it comes to erotic books, I get that some people find forceful, non-consensual sex acts to be a turn-on. I don't want to kink shame anyone who is turned on by the scenes in this book, I'd be lying if I didn't enjoy them to an extent. But we have to agree that without consent, such acts are problematic at best and rape assault at worst. Anthony's first kiss did not have enthusiastic consent in any way. Kate barely shaking her head no is not a yes, especially considering such an act could utterly ruin Kate's reputation. Her eventual, her eventually leaning into the kisses, fine, I guess. 
but it reinforces problematic blurred lines, quote unquote, uh, messaging about how women want to experience sex acts. Plus, it comes on the heels of actual violence between them. So that's icky. The wedding night itself is a result of a forced marriage due to Anthony's bee sting moment. I'll let that slide because he was trying to save her, in spite of Kate repeating, repeatedly wanting him to get off her. When Kate asks for more time to prepare herself for sex, Anthony is angry and ultimately denies her request, dismissing her fears and needs as silly. Sure, Kate ultimately changes her mind and decides she wants to have sex, but the whole situation feels uncomfortably close to coercion. She technically gives consent, but when seen in the light of a forced marriage and their first kiss, it all feels a bit off. I get that you can chalk it up to the time period, but at the end of the day, it's a modern book written for a modern audience. I think Anthony's barely contained desire for Kate is meant to be hot, but it does reinforce this idea that men's sexuality is a force beyond their control. It's not for the record. If you're still reading, yes, we are. All of this is to say that I appreciate the show's adaptation, adaptation's consistent, enthusiastic consent between Anthony. We need more models of sexy consent, so I'm glad they got that so right in season two. What did you think upon reading, rereading these scenes? Thanks for all you do, your fellow Anthony fan, Eliana. I'm going to be honest, I find all those scenes hot. <laughs> 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 and you absolutely are correct that they're yeah. all incredibly problematic. Mm -hmm. And yet, I grew up reading some incredibly icky yeah. <laughs> romance novels. So, mm -hmm. like, the mm -hmm. the forced kiss thing, I'm like, babe, it's like water off a duck's back. It doesn't. I just didn't even register. And yeah. Yet, yeah, that is fucked up. Yeah. And yet, I did find it hot. And yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm problematic. What can we say? Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't have the, you know, the the same the same reaction to what we read in this book that I did with Warlegan for Pol you know, going back to Polar. Polar, yeah. Um, and you know, that's for me, you know, reading uh, Warlegan, um, you know, that was very difficult. Um, and, you know, I was <sighs> quite troubled by that. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest right along with you, Rita. Um, I didn't have the same little warning bells pinging in my head as I was reading this book. I think we've just become in completely indoctrinated into <laughs> romance yeah. novel nonsense. Yeah. Um, but I also think, yeah. like, I'm hanging my head in shame. <laughs> But it's also, like, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed about. I think we've just grown up in a time where this was normalized and mm -hmm. you just get used to it and you don't... Yeah. But also, like, sexuality is nuanced and there are mm -hmm. aspects of, like, not for... <laughs> but there are aspects of, like, power play which people do find sexy. Exactly. So Consensual non-consent, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not as straightforward as, like this is good, this is bad, I think. There's just room for nuance situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know. <laughs> Do I think that Julia Quinn would write this in the exact same way now? Probably not. Probably not. But Probably hindsight's not. 2020. This is a 22-year-old yeah. book, people. Mm -hmm. Like, if we yeah. were still writing the same things we were 22 years ago, um, that would be the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will completely agree with you that uh, I have a great appreciation of the show's enthusiastic consent yeah. that they had with uh, Kate and Anthony in the gazebo. Um, that, no, was I, I, that, that was so hot. That was hot AF, man. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was good. We like. We like you. He's nice. We like you lots. Um. <laughs> And from that Bora impression, do the next email. Okay. <laughs> Hello, wonderful podcasters. Uh, finally, I wanted to say how much I missed hearing your weekly installments, and I hope Rita had a safe and wonderful trip. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. that's that. Th those are two loaded words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
witnessed a car crash, but we'll talk about that later. Um, oh, dear. I recently <laughs> reread The Viscount Who Loved Me, and I have some thoughts and I have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling my opinions of the book may be at odds with yours at this point. I've come to the conclusion that, even with some flaws in writing, I really love Kate Sharma and show Anthony as a couple. More than book Anthony, Kate. As for Edwina, the jury's still out for me. I think I will have to... I will have to do another binge of season two, sigh, to make my determination. <laughs> Here is a list of my reasons why I like the show a couple better. One, age and confidence. In the books, Kate's 21, making her quite a bit younger than Anthony. She's not a good dancer, is considered average in the looks, and truly overall seems to have a confidence problem. Okay, show Kate has a confidence problem too. We're going to need to... Like, <laughs> um, Anthony, on the other hand, is the same age as the, both the book and the show. To me, book Anthony seems both arrogant and shallow. <laughs> he does not have any confidence issues. What? Did we read oh. the same book? Uh, as far as I could tell, uh, show Anthony is definitely arrogant, but he seems much more concerned with duty than anything else. Um, he also does not seem super confident to me, especially compared to Miss Sharma. Unlike her book counterpart, show Kate is much closer in age to Anthony at 26. She also seems extremely confident in all matters other than those of her own heart. Uh, she's a good dancer, can shoot a gun, and was actually good at Pall Mall from the get-go. To me, show Kate is much more an equal to show Anthony than in the books, and that's important to me in a romantic coupling. Two, uh, characteristics of the relationship, i.e. consent. So one of the things that irked me on the second reading of the book is Anthony's overall treatment of Kate in the first half of the book. Mm. Uh, in one of their early encounters in the study, he kicks her in the stomach and then kisses her without her consent. He kicks her because she's biting his leg. Can we... <laughs> Can we talk about that? I, this was not directed at you, but I've seen so many Reddit posts. Where, he kicks her in the stomach. <laughs> this is why I had to be off Reddit. She's biting him. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you bite me, I'm kicking you. That's that's just life. <laughs> it's like an involuntary reaction. You're just going to try and shake that bitch off your leg. Um, mm-hmm. it, yes. They continued. When she asks him why he did that, Anthony just says because he wanted to. <laughs> he <coughs> is, was no gentleman. Uh, also, I believe that Rita had said that book Anthony, when realising he had fears for Kate, decided he may have to court a woman who is not her sister. But upon reread, I found this is not the case. He has an internal monologue and then decides he's going to continue courting Edwina after all. Had the bee incident gone differently in the book, book Anthony may just have proposed to Edwina. Show Anthony on... The other hand, showed a great deal of respect to Kate. Tell me you feel nothing and I will walk away and I will stop. Along with every time he reminded himself that he's a gentleman and moments that will live rent free in my brain for years to come. Uh, it yeah, shows Anthony yeah. had kissed show Kate. I do not believe he would have continued his courtship of Edwina. Um, I think where the show failed us a bit when it comes to Anthony is the de- dragging out of the triangle. I could go on, but this email is already too long. Thanks for your time. Annie from Arizona. Thanks, Annie. Annie, I fundamentally disagree with you in absolutely everything. Oh, now come, 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 come. Book Anthony is a sweetheart with just as many issues as show Anthony. <laughs> How dare you drag my son this way? <laughs> Anthony, you know, after that first kiss in the in the book, um, while he talks a big game about wanting to pursue Edwina. Never does it. He never, never does. Exactly. He mostly just says shit to wind Kate up. Mm-hmm. And then he actually doesn't follow through. It's yeah. why we stand him. Meanwhile, show Anthony actually pursuing Edwina. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. crazy pants. Anyway. Yeah. Why yeah. am I, like, having them fight to the death? Which version of Anthony is better? It's the same person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dearest podcasters, a Julia Quinn book is like brain comfort food. I'm on my second and third reading of the Bridgerton series and have read as many other uh, Julia Quinn books as I can get my hands on since the beginning of the pandemic. It doesn't matter to me that you know who the two protagonists are before you start reading. With romance novels, it's about the journey, not the destination. I love the back and forth, in their head kind of storytelling. It's very immersive and escapist for me. 
perfect medicine for quarantine. The Canthony story is my kind of journey. I love the enemies to lovers trope. Kate is a great heroine, confident and outspoken on the outside, but doubtful of her worth on the inside. Anthony has the prideful aloofness on the outside, but very tender and thoughtful on the inside. I remember reading the book for the second time after season one of the show and wondering how in the heck they were going to pull off Anthony's inner feeling that he would die at 30 uh, when he was 38. At first, I thought maybe they would have him confess these feelings to Simone. Then I found out Simon. Reggae, or Simon, then I found out Reggae was not coming back. Oh, well. That probably would have been kind of boring anyway. I do think the show, <laughs> I do think the show got the spirit of these characters, except Edwina, from the books, from the book and made us understand the conflict that both Anthony and Kate had to overcome. Edwina was more of a plot device in the book and to some degree in the show, but I can understand why they changed her character to add some, a lot of drama. <laughs> I also think the show had to do something with the queen because the character and the actor are so great. Hence, we get a crazy wedding at the palace. Are there scenes from the book I wish they could have included? The library scene at Aubrey Hall may have added more depth to Kate and shown Anthony's compassion. I read somewhere on social media that Jonathan Bailey said that we would get that background in season three. Well, we and I think they left room for it in the show's world. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, also, the scene where Anthony escorts Penelope into dinner at Aubrey Hall is one of my favorites. And more Newton! Yes! Oof. I've decided to think of the show as a variation of the book instead of an adaptation. I have read my share of books with the, title, with the subtitle, A Pride and Prejudice Variation. Great characters can live many parallel lives and still be essentially the same. My dream is that the Bridgerton series becomes the Bridgerton universe and we get as many seasons and spinoffs as the Marvel universe has movies. I can't imagine tiring of it. Your faithful listener, Carol from Connecticut. P.S. If Michelle wants to read more Bridgerton books before next season, I personally don't think it would detract from your podcast. I don't really think it will spoil the show because they have ventured pretty far from the original storylines already. Just putting it out there. Yeah, that's true. Thanks, Thank you, Carol. Carol. Yeah. I mean, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> There's also like a whole set of prequels and spinoffs you can read if you want to fill the void. I love the prequels. Um, okay. Hello, Michelle and Rita. I came across your podcast after watching season two of Bridgerton. I love your recaps and insights to into the episode. I even went back and listened to season one. I'm going to go back and listen to the first season of your Poldark podcast. Oh, I'm glad God. I'm not the only one who slowly started to dread each episode. <laughs> oh, I don't, didn't even watch the last season because they ruined the characters and show. Um, I'm looking forward to your upcoming book club for the Viscount Who Loved Me. I've also enjoyed some of your podcasts on North and South and Pride and Prejudice. Will you be reviewing The New Persuasion with Dakota Johnson when it airs on Netflix this summer? Also, yes. would you two be interested in doing a podcast for The Gilded Age on HBO? Thanks for your lovely podcast. It's Janelle from... Is that Montana? And then OX. That, that can't be a real place. I have no idea. We're Googling this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. We are both frantically Googling. I think it's meant to be Montana. She's from Montana, folks. Okay, that was just <laughs> badly. Hey, you know, we we, 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 we don't know. We, we don't know. We're going to check. We're going to check wherever. Montana looks beautiful now that I've Googled it. Have fun. Um, yeah, we'll be doing the persuasion. I'm so excited. Yes, uh, Dakota definitely. Johnson is my appointed basic white girl that I love. Um. <laughs> I'm never watching The Gilded Age. Uh, really? How... No. I don't know. No, I don't fuck with Julian Fellows. Oh. A conservative lord. Seriously? Has... Yeah. He has a problematic voting record, so don't support this fucker. Oh, man. I love Downton Abbey. Well, is it a surprise that it's written by a posh boy? No. Has it's no not. respect for the working class. It's um, not. Um, but, you know, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Watch the Gilded Age. Apparently it's like the most expensive production <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, like, looks great. I love K 
Harry Coon. I hate that I can't watch it, but I, I, I just, I can't support that motherfucker. Um, <laughs> tell us, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I feel like he deserves the title. Unlike a lot of people, I <laughs> bash on this show. He's done some real damage to this country. So, oh, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. But I mean, enjoy Downton Abbey the movie if you really want to. Like that looks uh, cute. They're all in the south of France. Who doesn't love that? Yeah. <laughs> we'll be doing uh, Sanditon and then... Yeah, we got Sanditon and then... Um, Mr. Malcolm's List. Mr. Which... Malcolm, yes. Um, mm-hmm. I bought the book for that, so I need to read that. I was going to read it on holiday, but then uh, my family's annoying, so... <laughs> <laughs> All the best laid plans. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me enjoy my romance. Um, yes, I'm going to be reading that. Um, also, um, if you all follow us on Instagram, um, I'm sharing period dramas that feature LGBTQ plus um, main characters, awesome. not just side awesome. characters, the for everyone awesome. to enjoy during Pride Month. Because I like, I know we were both disappointed with the show's lack of queer characters this season, like gag me. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm just like, hey, there are alternatives. And some yes. of them are better than this. So yes. <laughs> enjoy. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, so, anyhow, gang, that's it for this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with our Season 2 Roundup podcast. Well, we will be wrapping this baby up. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to add to the discussion, then email us at inthebooksnetwork at gmail.com. Or you can go to our Tumblr and message us anonymously. It's up to you. We are available on all your social medias at In The Books Network. And if you like our podcasts, please tell your friends and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your pods. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.